hopefully. You know, the, the final thoughts really on storage for 09 is that, um, you know, the problem is real, um, it's, but it's just to me, it's not as scary as it once did. And I was talking with Chris Dwan about this earlier this afternoon, is that um, one of the nice things about the storage dilemma is that um, our rate limiting bottlenecks now are actually chemistry, reagent cost, and some of the human factors involved in running these operations. Uh, that's more of a throttle uh, uh, than anything else that we can really talk about. What I typically see when it comes to storage is we're still generating data at a ridiculously high rate. The problem is understandable. The problem is within the bounds of, of reality. And more importantly, we have yet to run into any customer, large or small, who is really, really, you know, sort of absolutely at a standstill. Basically, everybody we've talked to has solved this particular problem in their own way. There's a bunch of different ways to tackle the IT requirements. Um, you know, if you, have a lot of, if you have a lot of administrative bodies, um, you can just buy Sun Thumpers, and you can go, you know, Thumpers per instrument, and you'd be happy there. You've got a high administrative burden, but a low IT cost. Another environment where you've got very, very low admit operator resources, you buy into Isilon. And there's some Isilon stories here, you know, two petabytes being managed in the spare time of an employee. Um, so you can really balance between what do I spend on capital versus what do I spend on human. And I don't want to just pick out Thumper or Isilon. There's, there's a whole array of products and technologies out there that will fit what your budget needs are, what your staffing requirements are, and what your timelines are. And really the take home message is, is that we haven't found anybody who's completely failed at this. It's a scary problem. It's a big problem. Everybody, large and small, seems to be staying relatively on top of it so far. All right, I'm going a little bit quicker here for some, for some time reasons. Um, uh, you know, green IT, um, this is me being cynical here. Um, this is the first time I've seen a deployment of storage with uh, automated power down. Um, one of the really neat things about that is we actually saw real world electrical savings from our storage arrays, which is something that I traditionally haven't seen before. I'm going to skip some of the stuff down here because I've got more slides coming up on it before. Um, I am cynical about green IT because it reminds me of capital G grid computing. It's hyped beyond all reasonable measure, all reasonable expectation. They're definitely promising more than realistically can be delivered. But there are real world scientific IT budget and actually uh, you know, earth friendly reasons for doing this. And it really does have a tangible result on the bottom line. So in terms of my bullet list of you know, where green IT matters for me, um, more, more capabilities in a smaller space, putting capacity into places that previously couldn't support it, and finally, you know, reducing you know, my sort of facility costs, air, condi air conditioning, cooling power, that sort of thing. The aha moment for me when it comes to green IT is um, there's a tier two storage product by a company called uh, Nexan called Sata Beast and uh, uh, made is massive array of idle disks. Um, we turned on the auto made feature and we saw a dramatic 30% reduction in power draw. Real world, you know, we had 100 terabytes spinning, we turned on auto made, boom, 30% reduction in, in electrical usage and no appreciable impact on the scientific workflow that was running. So my aha moment for green IT was 30% power savings by using auto made on storage. Um, Best 2009 moment, there's some people in the room responsible for this system, was a, a multi-thousand core HPC cluster that um, has some of the best built-in power management stuff that I've ever seen. Um, there is a system management interface that knows how to talk to platform LSF. It can shut down queues, it can shut down nodes. It's so tightly integrated into the workflow that they actually power up and power down nodes on demand going all the way out to the application space where um, you know, they'll close off the queue in LSF, stop sending jobs there, wait 15 minutes, node powers down. The really cool thing about that is that, um, and this is where you get into politics and everything else, is um, it helpfully emails management uh, how much money it's saved uh, you know, every time it's done it. And, and that's important. You know, a lot of this stuff is disruptive. Some of this stuff costs money. But if you can put it into nice, friendly email terms like this and you could back it up with real numbers, uh, it's very, very important. And this goes on to my ultimate cynical thing is, um, it is absolutely valid to use green IT for political cover when you're trying to do uh, efficiency efforts in your facilities. And my, my example here is, um, you know, this, this whole concept of powering down servers when you don't need them, that's a problem for the network monitoring guys who rely on pinging. Uh, if you shut down a server that's known to be, you know, good, it's going to set off a whole bunch of alert storms. So this is my cynical way of saying, uh, you know, if you want to get anything out of the green IT movement, consider using it as sort of political cover for efficiency moves that you were planning anyways. Uh, and I've done it and it works. Utility computing, um, the, the term here, it means too much to too many things. Um, you know, from my perspective, I'm talking about building blocks, workflows, and replicating or relocating complex systems into the cloud. Um, to be honest, utility computing, cloud computing, it's honestly not rocket science. It's fast becoming sort of boring and understood. Um, and it's really, really easy to understand what works and what doesn't work in the cloud. It's actually not that hard at all. Um, the economics are very, very clear. I'm actually just going to skip this slide for slide reasons. Everybody's got the whole, you know, what you can do for 10 cents an hour on demand type stuff. Um, 
in terms of setting the term for some of the vocabulary I'm going to use in the upcoming slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about Amazon Web Services. So uh, EC2 is the compute cloud. That's the, the servers on demand. S3 is the storage bucket service. EBS is the sort of volume-based storage service. That's a relatively new Amazon feature. And SQS is a queuing system. Um, while I'm on the topic of being honest, to me, Amazon Web Services is the cloud. I mean, everybody else is basically fooling themselves or they're believing their own marketing. Um, it is simple, practical, understandable with just a few hours of work. I've solved many, many real-world customer problems with it. And the rate that Amazon is rolling out features is really amazing. Actually, the one that just came out a couple weeks ago is uh, Amazon has a Hadoop clone running now, uh, Elastic MapReduce. And actually, one of the few real-world applications you can actually run is a life science application. It's a uh, short read mapping uh, called Cloudburst. Um, so for me, you know, I'm being, I'm being perfectly honest. Um, Amazon has a multi-year head start on the competition. That's not to say Amazon's going to win, but um, they're, they're pretty far ahead and they're rolling out features very, very fast. Um, the reason why I've drank in the Kool-Aid, uh, I'm known to be a cynic about grid computing. So really, uh, at the end of the day, it boils down to I saw it, I used it, I solved real-world customer problems with it, and really that's all that matters. I come from a demanding enterprise production computing environment. If it solves a problem for me, it's a good thing. I'm going to talk a little bit. Actually, you know what? Um, the, earlier today, there was a talk at the HPC workshop where we talked about uh, uh, Rosetta++ docking stuff. Um, basically, a, a really good uh, use case on uh, using uh, docking software from Pfizer on EC2. Um, I would encourage you, if you're interested in seeing more about this, check out Giles' slides from the HPC pre-conference workshop today. But we had a really good uh, uh, workshop covering some of the workflows of how to move on a uh, docking workflow onto EC2. Um, I'm going to skip the EC2 architecture stuff. It was covered definitely in the slides before, and I'm uh, a little bit nervous about time. Um, really, the only pet peeve that I have here is that um, one of my pet peeves when it comes to cloud computing and utility computing is security. Um, I've had been in a number of unfortunate meetings where IT staff talking about the cloud have demanded security precautions that they themselves are completely incapable of offering within their own infrastructure and within their own company. And you know, one of the things I'd suggest is that you know, don't demand the cloud do something that you are completely unable to do on infrastructure that you designed, you owned, and you built, and you operated. Um, generally speaking, I think Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have better internal practices than you know, many of us. All of them are happy to talk down and dirty when it comes to security. And in many cases, I think a lot of the security concerns are more related to politics or empire protection or you know, things like that. So really, the take home message here is you've got to do your own due diligence. There are very, very valid security questions. Um, I I've seen some fairly suspicious security questions arising from people who sort of feel threatened by this utility computing model coming up. Um, all right, yeah, I'm going to skip over the pet peeve stuff. Um, one of the biggest problems right now with cloud computing, particularly with Amazon, is that um, you know, compute power is actually, in many ways, the, the easiest problem for me to solve. I'm, I've been building clusters and grids for years. Compute power is cheap. It's easy to acquire. The biggest problem is data. The biggest problem with the cloud-based service is ingesting data into the cloud. Um, there is no easy solution to push a terabyte or two a day into Amazon. If you're big enough, you can peer with them. Uh, if you're not big enough, you're basically limited to what your, what your pipe can push across the internet. Um, there's a bunch of features that I, I sort of listed here that I'd really like to see out of Amazon. Um, I have to be careful what I'm say, except I have to be careful with the words that I use, except I'm going to say I am 100% confident that Amazon is working on the data ingestion problem and have patience. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but there's some interesting things that can happen on the cloud once we have the ability to stuff terabyte or petabyte volumes of data into the cloud. 